Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through The Lawyerist Lab. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Zach Glazer. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 347 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, I'm talking with Lawyers Lab coach Ryan McKean and his client happiness coordinator, Brittany Green, about how her role as a client happiness coordinator helps create a client centered firm. Today's podcast is brought to you by Text Expander, Postali, and Rankings.io. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, so stay tuned, and we'll tell you more about them later on. So, Zach, today we thought we would tackle a topic that probably not a lawyer, lot of lawyers think about, which is the lifetime value of a client. Yeah, how do you like thinking about that as a lawyer? How much is this client going to make me? You know, that just kind of feels icky, but you have to do it, right? Well, it's data. Right. And that's the point. It's information. And it's information that allows you to make strategic keyword decisions, you know, about your marketing. Because if you Mm -hmm. know how much you think a new client who walks in the door and signs with you is going to bring in terms of revenue over the lifetime, over their lifetime and of their interaction with you in the firm, well, then now you can make really smart decisions about how much you might be willing to spend to acquire that client. Right. And that's the, I don't want to say the first step for marketing, but that's a really important thing to have in your, in your head when you're trying to attract that client, when you're doing your own marketing there. Yeah. We talk a lot about being strategic and what does that mean? And it means putting the right resources in the right places, but it also means the appropriate amount of resources. So if we were just to use an example If I was bringing in a new estate planning client and I charge a flat fee of $3,000 and maybe I expect them to do one update a couple of years later for, let's just call it $2,000 to make my math easy, (laughs) we now could say that I anticipate that that client is going to generate $5,000 over their lifetime to the firm. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, I probably wouldn't want to spend, say... $4,000 $4,000 or even worse, $6,000 right. to acquire that new client because now it's not worth it. But if I'm doing a campaign that I can decide I can get a new client in the door for $250, then I might want to do that. Or I get to decide how much I'd be willing to invest knowing how much that client's going to potentially generate. Well, that's exactly right. When you look at the numbers on what you have to spend, in order to advertise on, on say, Google ads or Facebook ads. And you say, okay, well, do I want to spend this? Let's just use $250. Do I want to spend this $250? I'm going to get in front of X amount of people. And I know that when I spend on this ad, I get four leads. And I'm usually able to convert 25% of the leads that come in my door. And I spent $250. The lifetime value of this client is $4,000. You made money provided that you're not, you know, just throwing it down the train on, on ridiculous things and overhead, but you made money there and you're able to say, okay, well now do I want to double my ad spend? Is that going to get me eight leads, which I can convert into two? You're able to start to look at those things and say, okay, well my extra money I need to put into this sort of advertising or my extra money I don't need to put into this sort of advertising. I need to actually make it to where I'm spending less on these clients once they get in the door. Yeah. In order to get this type of data, though, a lot of times for me, I talk to people about using a a CRM, you know, or using dial pad or or recognizing, trying to find out where your clients are coming from. But you can't track this information generally on just a spreadsheet. This is something you you're probably going to have to have some technology for. You're probably going to have to have some way of dealing with your client intake your way of seeing how much they, they are worth. I mean, I think that's right. And maybe eventually, but if you're hearing that right now and freaking out, don't let that prevent you from starting to track. If you've got nothing else, I'd rather you start with a spreadsheet 
I'd rather you just yes. ask every call that comes in the, that you get, you know, how did you hear about me? Put it on a spreadsheet and then we can start tracking that person. You know, did they convert? Did they eventually engage you? And how much did they spend with you? Because that's going to be powerful information going forward. Right. Yeah. I, I tend to lean towards what technology can I put into this thing, but you're absolutely right. You know, you can do a lot of these things. Just, it is about asking. And that's something I, I had trouble in my own practice is saying, well, Hey, how did you hear about me? And it's not feeling uncomfortable asking the question. It's remembering to ask the question a lot of times. Mm, that's where a good script or process or checklist can come in, right? Like, did we ask right. the client this? And and if it wasn't you that's asking, maybe it's the person who's hiring or answering the phone right on the front end. So there's lots of different people who can get this information from you if if for some reason you forget or ideally you build it into your system. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we talk about Google ads or Facebook ads or something like that, but, you know, that may not be where your ideal client is. Your ideal client may be at an event that you go to. You may, you may want to go to... What are those called? Networking events? <laughs> no, the businesses in the area. Well, BNI is one. There's there's several groups, but whatever event or group you go to, here's the thing. Because here's the mistake we often make is we think, well, that's free. I'm just going to go to the event. Or that's $25 right. for my ticket to go to the event. And we're not actually accounting for our time as part of that cost. So just make sure absolutely networking and referral-based marketing is for sure a part of it, but you want to make sure you're accounting your time smartly. I knew I worked with an attorney who was a member of like 12 different organizations. And when we added up how much time she was spending doing all these things, mm -hmm. she was spending like thousands of dollars each month in her marketing, not realizing it because that was time she was not spending billing, doing other things for client work. Then this is where it gets interesting. Because now you can say, well, I'm spending $5,000 going to events and I'm getting one client a month at $4,000 lifetime value. Or I could run an online campaign for a $500 and generate two leads. And so this is where it gets fun too, because now you can start comparing the information and really getting a fuller picture of your data and really understanding which marketing campaigns working for you and where you should be willing to invest more money if you want to grow your firm and, and get more clients in the door. Right. Because we're, we're not talking about, do I spend marketing dollars on this one thing? There's not one way to do your marketing. You generally have a couple of irons in the fire. And so knowing which one is, is doing better, knowing which one is ripe for more money to be spent in, that's the key here. Yeah. So Super helpful information. I hope you guys are thinking about that in your business. Again, it's data, it's information that you can use because you want to drive more strategic decisions in the business. So now we have Stephanie's conversation with Ryan and Brittany. Hi, I'm Ryan McKean. I'm a coach at Lawyerist and CEO of Connecticut Trial Firm. None of that is all that interesting about me, but I'm going to tell you my biggest regret. I don't even think I've ever shared this with anybody, Stephanie. I passed on, I had Wu-Tang Clan and Rage Against the Machine tickets, and I passed on it to go on a date. Oh, did you marry her? Yes. Okay. Well, then all's forgiven. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and we brought along a special guest with you today, Ryan. Brittany, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I am Brittany Green. I am the Client Happiness Coordinator here at Connecticut Trial Firm. I've been here for just about a year now, and I am really glad that Ryan and Andrew brought me on to the team. Awesome. So we'll just start with just your intro, Brittany, because if you didn't catch that, Brittany is the Client Happiness Coordinator. Did I get that right? Yes. And I think it's fair to say most law firms do not have a full-time Client Happiness Coordinator on the team. And so we wanted to have you guys on today to talk a little bit more that, about this, because I think we often talk about being client-centered and we throw around that term a whole bunch, be client-centered, but sometimes it's hard to actually put it in practice and understand what that means in real life. And I think your role, Brittany, and what you're doing is a great example of that. So what does it mean? What is a client happiness coordinator? So the sort of simple answer is, of course, it's client relations. It's what it says, client happiness. We are a firm that truly cares about the client 
and their whole experience with us. And the only way that we can know if the client is happy is if we have someone checking in on them and relating to them. So that is what I am here for. And that's what my, my job consists of is checking in with each and every one of our clients throughout the entire process that we are with them and making sure that everything we are doing is satisfactory, hopefully above satisfactory for them. And I'm a great first step if there ever is a problem that they're encountering so that it never gets to a point where they're so unhappy with us, they want to leave. So I'm a good sort of intervention strategy as well. But thankfully that it's very rare to ever get to that point because just having me in the, from the very beginning makes everyone in our client base uh, very happy and it makes them feel heard. It makes them feel understood. It makes them feel a little better to talk to someone who isn't just their lawyer. Yeah. It's a little easier to relate to just a regular person, quote unquote. Yeah, no, that's great. And I want to unpack a bunch of what you said, but Ryan, let me, let me bring you back in for a second and tell us why did you decide to hire for this position and make it a full-time role? And also maybe at what stage was the firm? So this wasn't your first hire, but it also wasn't your 50th. So I want to hear just from your perspective, what you were thinking when you decided to create this position. Sure. And what, I mean, what we were thinking is what you said. You hear a lot in this space about, you know, being client centered and and these things. And, you know, it occurs to me that if you accept that that is important and at our firm, we do, that is something that's worth hiring into and worth investing in and not giving just lip service to, but being very intentional about it. Part of it is our situation. We are a growing firm, but we are in the personal injury space. And in the personal injury space, we are competing against people who have millions of dollars into marketing budgets into our specific market. We're a bootstrap firm. I started my firm with $2,500 and built the firm really by making clients happy, by doing good work for them. So when we're like, well, how can we grow this some more? Yeah, we could do something like we could invest in billboards or we could invest in TV ads or those kinds of things that firms do, or we can invest in what we already have, which is our existing client base. We can meet their needs in a way that's better, and we can create some real human connection with them. Part of it was in the sense of the pandemic where I think people are feeling very isolated it was like, we have an opportunity to create some connection and let's see what comes of that. Yeah. So Brittany, one thing you mentioned is that you're checking in with them and that constant source of communication. Do you have a, a cadence that you try to touch every client in some regular period? Yes. So as soon as they sign up with us, my first step is to send them a welcome packet, uh, which is really important to us. So we send them a book called Empower Yourself which really gives them full knowledge of, of everything that they should be expecting in this process. It really gives the power back to them. Uh, we give them a few little trashy gifts and whatnot, but more importantly, we have a handwritten note that I handwrite them that thanks them for trusting in us and you know, make sure that you feel free to give us any questions or concerns at any time and that we're excited to work for them. And that handwritten note is very important, of course, showing them that human connection that someone really did care enough to put this package together for them. Um, And then about two weeks in, I give them a call or or a text if they prefer that. Of course, age range depends on who likes to text, you know, versus get a a phone call. Right. And, you know, connect them, introduce myself. If it is through text or even with with the call, I like to follow up with a short video that I send them a pre-recorded one so that they can see my face uh, since we very rarely see clients in person anymore. So, you know, that human connection with me and my face, introduce myself a little. And then typically about every month or so, I task myself to follow up again with each client in their schedule that they've been with us. And again, it could be a call or a text just something quick with them. Um, But uh, what's great, you know, is that I see every text that comes into our system as well with with clients. 
as soon as I see a text, if, if I notice that it seems they may be unhappy with something or something's happening with them, you know, they're going to have a surgery or their dog just died, whatever it might be. I am able to get myself in, into that situation as well. And either, you know, give them a call, I can send them cookies or mitigate whatever the situation might be. Yeah. And you've talked about this with us before. And, and I love these examples where you're able to kind of see what's going on in their lives and then give a very targeted and personal response. So they're having a baby, you send a baby gift. If it's something with their dog, you're sending the bark box. And I think, I think that goes a long way when, and probably I would suspect is a lot more meaningful when, you know, I know as a, I always love getting a gift that is more thoughtful than just getting like a branded cup. I mean, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. Some branded cups are nice too. I'm drinking out of one right now, but <laughs> But every once in a while, when you know someone's gone that extra mile to put that thought behind that gift. And I love that that's, I think, what you're charged to do as well. And and so, I don't know, let me put you on the spot. What are some of the more creative things that you're kind of proud of that you were able to come up with as part of this? Yeah, so I will let Ryan take credit for some of this, but a lot of times with baby gifts, you know, if, if someone we know is having a baby, we uh, like to send them diapers, of course, because you can never have too many diapers, but specifically we like to send them spoons because it's one of those things that not many people, like I said, thanks to Ryan for this idea. Not many people think about how many spoons you go through. And it's not a typical baby shower gift that a lot of people either think about needing or, or want to give that kind of thing. So it's definitely something that new parents appreciate once they're in the, the throes of new parenthood. They're really happy to have those kind of things. And then even simple things when it comes to, instead of sending the usual flowers when someone passes away, we don't like to send flowers because who wants a gift that's just going to die and remind them more of death? Right. So instead, something a little more uh, exciting, uh, a little different is succulents. Everyone loves succulents now. I know I am horrible at my green thumb, it's so not green. So succulents are something I can, can, you know, keep alive forever. And so it's something that's, that's nice for, for people who still, you know, enjoy flowers, but don't want to have to deal with, you know, throwing them out or anything after a week. And then who wouldn't want cookies, you know, when they're having surgery, you're sitting on the couch recovering, you're going to want a snack, right? So we send cookies from milk bar or really any place that we've found that is super tasty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we sent a, someone else was having a baby. We sent a personalized baby blanket that they just absolutely loved. Um, that one, I was really happy with the reaction that I got. The text was just so sweet. The thank you text, which always makes my day. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And I, and I mean, it's more about the thought and that you guys are, exactly. are being intentional about connecting with your clients in this way. Ryan, you were saying something um, before we started recording that was interesting that I think ties into this too, a little bit of your philosophy around wellness and just kind of how you approach that and trying to empower your clients because you're dealing with injured people. And so you're trying to look for ways to help them be well. So say more about that. What does that look like for your practice? I, well, I know the reason I do this work because I went through this process. I was in a car accident. I had my car totaled. I know how overwhelming that all feels. I also know that having been a lawyer long enough that clients aren't coming to us, they're coming to us with problems, not just legal problems. And to me, the opportunity to honor and respect that this is a whole person going through something or a family going through something and seeing it and hearing it and acknowledging it, it just seemed like really low hanging fruit to create the kind of world that I want to live in a world of care and compassion and empathy for others. Yeah. I love that. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. When we come back though, I want to dig in a little bit to the ROI on this because some people may be thinking, okay, this sounds good, but what am I going to get? We'll be right back. It's hard to keep up with trends when you're rushing to court and helping clients. But new cases hinge on topping the results page. You need a marketing partner to keep you informed and your firm growing. That partner is Postali. And you should know about Google Local Service Ads. LSAs connect you with folks searching for nearby legal services. 
LSAs show up at the top of the page, higher than maps and other listings. And the best part, you only pay if you're contacted through the ad. Appearing when somebody searches for lawyers near me has never been easier or more affordable, letting you focus on the law. LSAs are a great addition to existing PPC efforts or a standalone initiative. Quickly initiated by the Postali team, LSAs and a partnership with Postali can get your firm where it belongs. To learn more about LSAs and Postali services, visit postali.com forward slash lawyerist and reach out for a free consultation. Support for today's episode comes from Rankings.io, a search engine optimization agency working exclusively for personal injury law firms. Simply put, Rankings.io helps personal injury law firms dominate first page rankings. You'll never have to chase them for an update or hunt them down for an answer. Your clients expect you to be accessible, and rankings will meet that standard for communication and transparency. You'll have a full team of SEO specialists fighting to put you at the top of the Google search results. Personal injury lawyer SEO is all they do, so all of their processes, playbooks, and people are completely focused on generating qualified cases for your firm. Best of all, you'll be one of an elite few. Delivering exceptional service and results requires focus, so Rankings.io carefully vets clients before accepting them. They're an ideal fit for growth-oriented personal injury law firms. To see if you're a fit, visit Rankings.io forward slash lawyerist to get started. Support for today's episode comes from Text Expander. Text Expander removes the repetition out of work so you can focus on what matters most. Say goodbye to repetitive text entry, spelling and message errors, and trying to remember the right thing to say. When you use Text Expander, you can say the right thing in just a few keystrokes. Better than copy and paste, better than scripts and templates, Text Expander snippets allow you to maximize your time by getting rid of the repetitive things you type while still customizing and personalizing your messages. Text Expander can be used in any platform, any app, anywhere you type. Take your time back and increase your productivity. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. Okay, we're back and I'm talking with Ryan and Brittany. Brittany is Ryan's client happiness coordinator. And Ryan, I am sure there are some people who are thinking, well, that's great, Ryan, that you were able to invest this money and that's maybe it feels extravagant or like a hire that's way down the road for people. And I think you made it earlier in the process because you saw an opportunity there to really take care of your clients. And I'm just curious, what kind of return are you seeing on this investment in terms of client response and reviews and referrals and, and, and honestly money, let's just get to the heart of it. (laughs) So, so Brittany, for us, uh, this position, I think was hire number 11 for us. So we, we did hire early sort of in, in, in a process, but in part it was just us saying like, look, we need you, we've done agency things, we have vendors, we have these things in place, but it's, it's really our time to invest in somebody in-house and how can we best deploy them? So it was like, okay, this client happiness position makes a lot of sense because when I do personal injury work, in some markets, the average cost per case acquisition is $2,500, $3,000. You see other numbers on the low end of the spectrum thrown in around a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars for any single case acquisition. And look, most cases, a lot of these cases are going to be not significant value. Right. So, and some of them will be, but if we get a referral from a client, like we're not paying a referral fee, like our cost per case acquisition goes down. Okay. And I believe our cost per case acquisition to be about 50% of what market rate is. And so that's that's a real efficiency because we are doing the things to take our clients from somebody who has an issue and ideally trying to turn them into promoters and fans of our work. And that happens, we've seen with Brittany, we have, I think, since Brittany's been with us, we've amassed about 100 more five-star reviews than we had before. And that is very significant. We are tops in our market for five-star reviews for what we do. And that matters a ton in terms of business generation. When they call, they say, I read your reviews, right? Yeah. That's the number one thing. If it's a friend, and in in personal injury, 
if somebody finds you online, they on average call about five lawyers. And so whoever picks up the phone first, it's a mad dash. But if somebody who has a trusted friend or a family member say, oh, no, 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 call Connecticut trial firm, they are not in such a hurry to to hire. It's not like an emergency that we have to put them through our intake process like that minute, right? right. Um, so there's there's relief there. And part of it is, I mean, just I was looking at our numbers from August last year versus this year. And some of this is sort of pandemic related noise, but others of it, I think, is directly related to this. It is honestly hard to parse out, but our leads were up 300% year over year by really investing in this, what I think is pivotal and at the core of our growth strategy. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. And I know you're talking in terms of personal injury, but there's a lot of really competitive spaces out there for lawyers. I mean, from family laws to estate planning, I mean, there's lots of places where there's lots of competition. So I don't think the things you're saying, you know, are just about for the PI lawyers out there, like everybody can benefit from a client happiness coordinator for sure. There's an incidental, I think, economic benefit here, which is that one of the things that was grading our paralegals was dealing with clients who may be upset in some which way, mm. okay? And that drains them emotionally. That takes up a lot of time for them. Time, they're not doing the work that they need to be doing, like preparing the discovery or uh, you know, making sure the depositions are scheduled okay or making sure the med chronology is correct or doing these things that are that are really sort of important. And so by having Brittany to at least be like the first point of contact, I am taking that off all of their shoulders. Yes. And their personality types, we do personality testing, like our paralegals are very, they have personalities to be great paralegals, but they, boy, does it suck their energy to deal with these kinds of things. So Brittany's personality fits this perfectly. And that makes us more efficient. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And and it brings up kind of maybe a final piece to cover, which is if you're looking to hire someone into this role, you know, what kind of person and what kind of skill set do they need? Is there something specific that you're looking for in that interview process to make sure you get the right person? I mean, for me, I, I think, you know, we're big on the Myers-Briggs test. And I mean, for us, it was an extrovert. We wanted somebody who's energized by other people. And we wanted somebody with an F in their personality who was also sensitive. Got it. And Brittany, from your perspective, being in the role, what would you tell somebody in terms of what they need to be successful? Or maybe if you were training someone else to do this role, what what advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, piggybacking off what Ryan said, like, so my Myers-Briggs is ENFJ, you know, extroverted, intuitive, which, you know, I do think is is really important for that role too. So I do think that's something that people should look at because again, you want to sort of try to expect what these clients are feeling and what they're expecting. And then of course, as you said, have that F in your personality, the feeling so that you can empathize with them. But there is that shift where you need to make sure, you know, of course, I'm a very empathetic person, but making sure, you know, for your own mental health, if this isn't the right role for you, you need to know is hearing about people's problems. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're going to be traumatic, especially in something like this with personal injury. You want to make sure uh, for your own well-being that it's not something that you're going to take home with you and, you know, feel when you're at home and everything. And, and that's not to say, of course, that you know, am I callous, uncaring person? Of not at all. Of course, I feel for these people deeply, but you know, it's just important to be able to separate yourself from the role and and you know, know that it's you can only do so much for this person, and what you're doing for them is enough. So I think that is very important in, in this type of role. So yeah, so you know, being extroverted, having that um, intuition, and being able to know sort of ahead of time what these people are going to need or want. And being empathetic, but knowing that you can protect your own uh, mental health and well-being as well. Yeah, for sure. No need to apologize there. We're big advocates of that for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. This has been great. I hope that people who are listening have been inspired. Maybe you can create your own client happiness coordinator or 
if not a full-time position, at least designate someone on the team who's thinking that with that hat on, with that role on, and can be that resource for clients because it makes a difference, right? And I think it's a real great way of putting clients first and being client-centered. So thank you both for coming on. I always learn so much. I love what you guys are doing. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Stephanie, for having us. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Ryan Croft. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discussed here into your practice, wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com slash book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.